This is not your mother's middle age. No longer is waking up each day, living the wash, rinse, and repeat cycle acceptable. We have the life lessons, the relationships, the wins, and the losses with which to navigate to our highest self without hesitation and without fear leading the way. We have been there and done that, and so we have so much to offer the world and each other. So join me on this journey speaking to ordinary women doing extraordinary things for new insights, new ideas, new medical breakthroughs, and new life lessons. You will be inspired to find your best life here and now. My name is Wendy Charles McGuire, and this is your Second Wind Podcast. Second wind. Today I have kind of a different situation. I had this wonderful man reach out to me and his name is Peter Vox and he has written a book. However, he's a very, it's, it's just an interesting story and how we met and we've been talking for hours ever since. But He's a very accomplished man. He's a songwriter, a teacher, a musician, a voiceover for characters, a father, and as I said, an author. But most of all, he's a survivor. Peter, during his entire life, battled a family filled with uh, mental and psychological illness. And Peter found his way through tons of medications that didn't serve him, stays in psychiatric wards, and his book is actually titled The Psych Ward Notes, Surviving Anxiety and Depression. And when he reached out to me, I was like, well, I don't really interview men's stories, but this is kind of very relevant. And I said, you know what? Something's telling me I should talk to Peter. And Peter was so gracious in, in opening up about his story. And I was intrigued because I've had now three friends commit suicide and two of whom no one saw coming like crazy. So I am so happy to have you here and shed some light on this for us. Like why, why these things happen? What is this all about the psych wards? We all have our own ideas of what that is and what, what brought you to that and how did you survive? So wow. welcome, Peter. Good morning. Thank you for having me. I'm honored to be here. Thank you. Thank you. So tell my second wind audience, sure. now your second wind audience, mm -hmm. about that thing that, that you would call your second wind. The second wind occurred. I had retired early from teaching. Um, I, it, this was a culmination of 10 years of life changing events. And it was one little straw that broke the camel's back. I was on a lot of medications at the time, um, uh, Ativan being one of them. And I didn't realize that one of the side effects was suicidal ideation on from Ativan. So mm -hmm. when I was feeling suicidal, I was, you know, I was taking more of them and they make you feel great. That's the problem with benzos, why they're so addictive. So long story short, I took about 15 of them, one milligram tablets each. Um, and I went to sleep on, on a beanbag chair and my mother was at my apartment. And this had been, I had been hospitalized four times already uh, for the anxiety and depression. Um, and I remember laying down and saying, thinking to myself, if I don't wake up, I don't care. Um, I had access to oh, about 200 pills in my apartment. Uh, I had a, a ton of clonopin and a lot of Ativan. Um, but still, even though I didn't overdose, I, I took enough where I didn't care if I woke up. Mm -hmm. And um, and I woke up in the, at the hospital. And I sort of knew that I was going to have to stay uh, for an extended period of time. And at that point, I was willing. I said... I, I've, ha I've had enough. I felt like a pitcher in a baseball game. My arm, my shoulder's done. I need to, I need to hit the showers. You know, um, uh, the thing is that, um, you know, when you're thinking about uh, killing yourself, 
uh, we spoke earlier in the pre-interview was that it's it's a it's a, a temporary uh, thought that you've run out of ideas on how to help yourself. It's that it's is temporary. huge. Yeah. That is huge, and I feel like that's a thing. Like yeah. people just you've run out of ideas. Look past that, mm-hmm. and then and, then bad things happen. And I learned that that needs to be the signal of when you call for help, and you have to put your pride yeah. aside. You have to put everything that you think is important in life aside, your job, um, you know, you may have to spend time away from your family, but which was for me, the longest was 11 months without my kids. And, Mm -hmm. but 11 months is a drop in the bucket instead of a lifetime. So what's the trade off? And I call it a big time out, you know, a big pause. And one doctor said, Oh, well, it's a, it's one doctor says it's a well-deserved pause, which, you know, made me feel, got me some affirmation. Um, but one doctor said, you know, you're right. You, it's, it's time you take some extended time and really look at your whole life and everything that has happened. And, um, and what are we going to do from here? You know, and that started, that started the second one. What are you going to do from this point? You know, I don't want to die because the basis of my anxiety and depression is fear of death. So, um, Like we said, we're going to talk about that, but, Mm -hmm. um, so I need to live uh, for my, for my sons. Obviously I'm, I'm compelled to be around them. Um, it's obviously this issue has gotten in the way. Um, but I, you know, I see them six days a week, which is great. I drive them to school. I pick them up from school. You know, I have them every afternoon and I have them every Sunday. So I see them quite a bit, um, which is great. So you got to be around for your kids and, also to protect them from uh, hopefully not a mental illness like I have. I don't, I'm trying to, you know, maneuver them and sometimes maybe a bit too much, uh, you know, keep them away from certain subject matters. And, uh, but they seem to be, they're doing great. You know, um, they're doing well in school, uh, things like that. Um, and Unless, so you found, you found, when you got to when you got out of the beanbag chair and into the hospital yes. by that was the by point. not your will and mm-hmm. then being in the hospital and that's when you started writing the book yes right? so that's yeah. important and we'll we'll come back mm-hmm. to that because the book has been a huge blessing for you and it's, uh, it's yes. and it's new it's mm-hmm. just it just came out what 3 weeks uh, ago this, a month uh, ago in um, December, December 20th. Oh, okay, December, yeah, three, three months December. ago. Okay. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's it's a really interesting insight into the people and the stories. And it's an interesting the world there. It's very interesting. And mm-hmm. it's probably not what all of us grew up thinking it was. So that's important to, mm-hmm. to also shed some light on. Well, let's go back a little bit, Peter, because when sure. we first started talking, I was like, oh, you and I have the same fears and mm-hmm. I have had like many panic attacks over my mm-hmm. life. This is one of the reasons I started the podcast basically was I was looking for answers in any way I could find to the same questions wow. that you weren't finding answers to Correct. that mm-hmm. caused you to go in one direction and me to go in another. Mm-hmm. And, and we're going to talk a little bit about that because you had a, a predisposition to push you in that, in that way. And, and many people may or may not know if they have predisposition disposition (laughs) about that. So let's talk about that. You're a little kid. Mm -hmm. You have a a decent, um, you're living in a nice area in Roslyn, New York, and life is pretty good. Uh, Your dad's a little over the top with, with uh, fanatical, um, shall we say safety issues concerning mm-hmm. food and radioactive waves and all that stuff. Correct. But what was the question that was freaking you out that you said, these are questions I can't get answers to and they're making me nutty. It was what happens after you die. And um, I think out of all the fears to There's have, no it's, 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 it's gotta no be, 
got to be the worst one. Yeah. You know, they, yeah. they tell you, they say, in order to get over your fear, you have to face it. You know, get on that airplane. Well, I have a fear of death. So what am I supposed to do? <laughs> you know? Just her with um, it a little bit. Yeah, just, you know, um, it's unfortunately that was the first, my first awareness, what I said, cognitive awareness of life was being brought to the cemetery from my uncle's grave unveiling. I was, I was just about two years old. And uh, I which have wait, a, which wait yeah. is very incredible that you remember details from that. Yes, I do. Mm -hmm. Which, it was which a, creates sort of an empathic uh, situation for you. Yeah, there's a photographic memory there. Um, and I'll, I remember events, um, times I've spent with people, what they've said to me, um, where I was standing. I could tell you what direction, north, south, east, or west, things like that. Um, so. Uh, things tend to stick with me. So uh, that was my first memory. Um, my grandparents lived in Florida. So when they would come up to visit, we would go see, we would go to the cemetery and see my uncle's grave. And, mm -hmm. and um, I remember putting rocks as Jewish people, we put rocks on the gravestone to, to signify that. I, don't, I think it's to signify that you visited. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not, I'm not quite, I'm not sure if I'm correct on the meaning of it, but I remember putting rocks on the gravestone and, tracing the letters with my finger and things like that. And wow. uh, my mother, my, my father's, my uncle lost his wife when she was young, when, when she was 43. Uh, my uncle's son, who was my cousin, he passed away. So there was, a, there were a bunch of relatives that passed away early. Um, my what mother. What was going on through your mind with all these people passing away was, and you, your first real clear memories are being at a Oh, uh, great it's interesting because there's probably other things you could have remembered, but you remembered that. Yeah. Um, it, for some reason, it was, just, I needed to know what happens. I, I knew very early on, I had a picture of what God was in my head, you know, and he had sort of like brown curly hair and, and a beard, you know, um, not long curly hair, but short curly hair, you know, and I sort of look like a rabbi, I guess, you know, um, <laughs> And that's what I sort of pictured in my head at, uh -huh. at a very young age. And then um, it started becoming more philosophical at, at six and seven, like what's the meaning of life, you know? And, and while other kids are, I'm playing with my friends and all of a sudden I'd be stuck in a thought process. I'm, I'm going to die one day or what happens? Or I would be, um, I could sit and think about my parents dying and start crying about it. And actually- yes actually experiencing those emotions. Yes. So yes, yes, me too. And mm -hmm. and also you you said then you start asking yourself, well, if the universe was created by God or whatever you believe, mm -hmm. well who created God? Yeah. And what was before like, that? And what how was before did, that? how did that just happen? Mm -hmm. And even today I kind of if you inch there, you're like, oh okay, stop. Yeah. It the pro what happens is is I describe it as you go beyond your comprehension of what your brain can handle. And then for me, it causes sheer terror. I, I remember a particular weekend when I was in the ninth grade and it was just, it was hitting me hard. Um, at that point it, that had, that should have been a day I should have been hospitalized. I just remember yeah. I was sitting on my mother's side of the bed. My parents were odd. They had two twin beds pushed together. Like, you know, there was, a, there was this little borderline there. So if you slept with your parents, I'm like, I gotta sleep on the line between the mattresses. <laughs> anyway, so I'm on my mom's bed and I remember looking at the sheets and just feeling that um, I'm not in control of anything. And- yeah. um, That's scary. And this is way beyond, it was terror. And you can't think your way out of it. You don't know what's going on. I, I was hoping that my first ever- um, meet my first ever session with the psychiatrist that he would have the answer for me. Oh, this is what happens after you die. You know, oh, you go to heaven or, or, you know, it's peaceful or, or something, but he didn't have the answer either. And, you know, no one does. And, and, you know, people have faith in religion and things like that. But it, for me, the questions went deeper than that, you know, mm -hmm. um, and it went to, well, I don't remember anything from before I was born. So it must be like the same thing when you die, you know, and then, that sort of, that freaks you out too. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. you didn't feel pain. You know, you didn't feel pain because you, I think you'd remember it, you know, um, 
but you just don't exist. And that's something that, you know, if, if I sit and think about it for a while, I can start freaking out and, you yeah. know, that's, that's the basic foundation of it. You know, not having the answer drives you can drive you insane. And unfortunately that became an obsession and thoughts that would last for weeks, months, you know, years at a time. And would you tell your parents about how you were feeling? Oh yeah. All the time. Um, and then what, what did time. they do about it? Um, at a certain point, at, at certain points, my father would try to console me, you know, it's a long way away and it's not something to worry about now. And right. it didn't. Oh, my, stop thinking about it. That has nothing to um, do with you right now. Uh, yeah. A little bit, you know, they, they thought maybe I was exaggerating. Um, mm. But as I grew older and learned that my dad had gone to therapy and um, uh, knew a bit, uh, unfortunately he wasn't, uh, using what he learned in therapy in, in his personal life and, and, uh, coexisting with us in the family. So we, you know, um, I wasn't beat up or abused like that or anything like that. It was just witnessing pain, um, mm -hmm. that didn't, have the wherewithal or didn't know that he was affecting his kids. Gotcha. And so, uh, you know, you're watching this your, your whole life and you're listening to how your parents communicate and then how my brother would react to it. My brother re reacted the total opposite way. He became rebellious and tough and organized and very successful and didn't take any uh, BS from anybody. Um, uh, he was a lot like my grandfather, my, my mother's, um, dad, who was the person of, of peace of mind in my family. Um, yeah, you found yourself being someone who kind of just sat back and watched and didn't really mm -hmm. stand up for yourself. No. And, no, and I, you I, believe now, looking back and through all of the things that you've been through, mm -hmm. is one of the things that causes people to break, to snap. Yes. Yeah, it's, and I worry about women uh, in their second wind, mm -hmm. who maybe have have had that be part of their persona sure, all their sure. lives. And then all of a sudden, here we are, and maybe the kids have gone, and maybe the, the husband and the relationship isn't quite how you envisioned it to be at this point. Mm -hmm. And you just don't know what's left and who am I. And it can be a very lonely place. Yes, it can. Um, you feel... Um, you get to a certain age where we talked about before my being a musician, um, relative to age is, is very similar to, I feel some women are treated in society and in, in certain aspects of it where your age matters, you know, entertainment being one of them. Um, and you start matters to, feel to others, Peter, that's important. Yeah, it matters to it matters others. To others. Correct. If, yes. If you embrace the second wind mm -hmm. idea, it's like, yeah. Oh, I'm actually on top of all this because I yes. have all the experiences and I know who I am and I feel confident. And mm -hmm. I don't really care what anyone else thinks. Uh, yes. But unless you've embraced that, mm -hmm. if you're stuck in the mindset of worrying, of not yeah, staying yeah, up, right. up, you can't see that. Yeah. Right? That's what you're Correct. saying. Yeah. You, yeah. So if you feel irrelevant and you give into, like you said, you give into these social pressures, like I said, I'm 52 and I sing, I play drums. Um, am I supposed to stop doing it? You know, um, I still love it. It gives, it's, it's a huge, probably one of the main things that helps keep the anxiety under control is, mm -hmm. is drumming and singing. Um, especially in front of people, uh, you get this connection with people, you make people happy. Um, which and, is very interesting in and of itself because people yes. would think that doing that in front of people would cause mm -hmm more anxiety <laughs> i've never experienced what the odd thing is that i've never experienced stage fright it was oh, I, I would be i would be excited before before gigs um and it would turn into just me going to have to pee a lot because i was so <laughs> juiced up to do it you know and i gotta go pee again you know and yeah, um, yeah, yeah i was in a group that we got lucky for a couple of hockey seasons we were one of the the New York Islanders would have a bunch of bands that would play in the arena. So you're playing for 12,000 people. So I remember the first time I did it, um, 
there I am on the jumbotron, you know, and on the four sided jumbotron, my big nose. Can't even imagine. Yeah, and um, the actually the best time before that gig was was sound check because we got a half hour to do whatever we wanted in in the yeah. empty arena, so it was great. But I but I remember just going to pee a lot before <laughs> performing. <laughs> I've never right experienced stage fright. <laughs> yeah. That is truly amazing. Yeah, and and Seinfeld on one of his on the intros to his show, he says, he goes, you know, I read a poll the other day. They said the number one fear that people have is public speaking. He said death was number three. <laughs> he goes, really? so you know, people would rather die than make a speech in front of somebody. And you and, and I are like, oh no 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 no. no. <laughs> yeah, yeah, being on camera <laughs> or being, <laughs> yeah, number it one. Is, you know. The and then, you know, I listen mm -hmm. to those things, and I'm sure you have, Peter. Where it's, um, it you're you're a soul living the existence of a human mm -hmm. rather than a human living the existence of the soul, or something like that. Right. Where you're supposed to be like, oh, I'm just here in this body for a brief moment, and then mm -hmm. I'm off to the next. Correct. And gosh, I want to believe that, but man, is it hard. It's very yeah. It's difficult. When, when you get older and, and you gain some wisdom and, you know, um, I don't want to diminish people that are religious because if it brings you peace of mind and it brings you comfort, I wouldn't want to take that away from somebody. Absolutely. You know? And if someone is comfortable uh, going to church and, and or temple or whatever, whatever you believe in is obviously as long as it's not hurting anybody and it gives you comfort in life, then, then go do it. You know, um, I, I recommend it if, if that's where you want to follow. Um, however, for, for the way my mind works, I need, I have a more of an ex existential mind. And in the last few years, you know, you read a little bit, a little bit about existentialism, but I don't delve in too deep because I don't want to get trapped in, you know, mm. in that thought process. So you, you, you dip your toes in the water a little bit, you know, and, um, Unfortunately, what happens is a certain subject matters will get stuck in your brain for for a while. Um, and I've gotten to the age where, you know, you can control it. You know, you keep yourself busy um, mm -hmm. with cognitive behavioral techniques, and um, you know, you learn to keep it at a at a at a low level. You know, the best you can. And if you're taking meds, you know, you just have to be careful what you're taking. Right, and, and you said you had about ten years. Mm -hmm. um, after being married and with the divorce of just kind of, and that, that divorce kind of sets you on your trajectory to have Correct. to go or finally go mm -hmm. and get the extended help yeah. of being yeah. in the ward for 11 months. 11 months. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, can you take us, you know, you had 10 years of a downward spiral kind of, mm -hmm. Yes. With, with what you said, you said you wrote in the book 18 medications, but really it was 21. It was 21. You them all up. I had so a, I'd I found some like, paper. Yeah. I'd also like to get your opinion on medications. Mm -hmm. Um, cause I'm of the belief just from my own research that a lot of medications that are prescribed for us, uh, keep us where we are. We don't mm -hmm. see any further advancement of whatever it is, but it also doesn't, prevent us it doesn't help us move past no whatever it is mm -hmm. so um but then i have i've talked to many people who have been on antidepressants and we've had people on the show who said yeah i had to take an antidepressant and made a world of difference and then i was able to live my life mm -hmm. so it's so what do you think um there's the best medication i found that worked without i mean there was a sexual side effect was paxil um, I don't even know if they make it anymore because I haven't heard the name in a very long time, but it worked great. And, but there were terrible sexual side effects and I was a young, in my twenties at the time and, and you don't want that. And then I was, I started taking Celexa, which then, um, upgraded to Lexapro. They added another, uh, ingredient or they, they changed it to, it's an SSRI serotonin uptake inhibitor. Um, and uh, I don't even know if I. I mean, what, but I, I want. That's no, okay. Yeah. I wonder what are your thoughts about medications in general. In general, I, I there's. I, I think in general they make you complacent. Um, mm -hmm. They take away creativity. Um, mm -hmm. 
they make you, for me, my personal experience, um, someone who didn't stick up for myself, it made me not stick up for myself even more. I was willing to really? let, I was willing to let more things go. Okay. Um, certain things at work, uh, certain things in the marriage, certain things with friends and family. Um, you just let roll off your shoulder. However, it builds up inside. And yeah, and that's led you down um, the good segue, Peter. Yeah. So, that was good. Thank you. Um, <laughs> I mean, so no matter how much you hold it in, it, and no matter how many meds you take, it's going to come out still. Yeah. And and I feel that's what happened to me. It fi- it came out, and I'm lucky that I'm not dead. I'm lucky I didn't beat anybody up. I'm lucky that mm. um, no one. You had rage. You said you said by the oh. time this surfaced. Mm-hmm. For you to be able to actually deal with it, you were angry. Sure. Very angry. And at that point, um, I think, you know, I didn't take it out on people where, you know, I, you have arguments with family and things like that. But um, I, I think the real reason why I never, I, I was just never someone that was, I know how to fight physically. Um, I played I played lacrosse in high school and college. I, and r- I roughhoused my whole life. I'm not afraid of getting physically heartbreaking a bone and things like that, which is odd because I have the death fear. But, (laughs) um, but during a sport, you know, I looked at it sort of, it's a game and you get hit eh, you break your you break your thumb. It's not cancer. It's a broken thumb. You can sort of see it, you know? Um, So um, the medications, you know, sort of stifle your life a little bit. Um, And then, it's not that you become lazy. It's just you become, you're you sort of okay with everything. It's all right, you know, when it's really not. And eventually, Blase, yeah, that word yeah. yeah. And um, it comes out. It, um, when I was a personal trainer, I had a woman going through a divorce. She was getting um, herpes simplex, the herpes you get in your eye, psoriasis on her knees, um, on her elbows, things like that, uh, all from the stress. You know, um, I had developed an itching disorder in my skin. I used to have hair on my legs. It's all gone uh, because I would scratch so much till I was bleeding. So it, it's going to come out in some sort of way. It's going to come out. Either you talk about it and, and verbally and write about it or express it to your therapist or somebody, or it's going to ferment in your in your body somehow. And you're going to you're going to get sick. In some way, ease of the body. Mm-hmm. Yeah, not you're, you're, just what you take in, but emotional mm-hmm. is just as powerful as eating something that's carcinogenic. Correct. I believe. Mm-hmm. Might as well just put a ticking time bomb right down yeah. your throat. Um, yeah, you develop all sorts of um, you know illnesses, all stomach ulcers and uh, indigestion. Uh, they call it GERD. You know, heartburn. Mm-hmm. Um, Unfortunately for me, the anxiety attacks would get so bad that every morning I would throw up um, wow. every day. Every day would feel like it's my first day at work at the first job I ever had. And every wow. morning, every morning before work, I would I would either throw up what was still left in my stomach or it would come out as bile, you know, stomach bile. And it's very painful because it's you're, you, you're it's like if you drank too much and you have the dry heaves after, you know, a, you party too much, you know, in the nineties and there's yeah. nothing left in your system to vomit, but you're still, you're retching. It's called retching. And you're just, yeah, it's just know. like my daughter who's pregnant right now. Oh yeah. my God. And it's, nice. it's, and you combine that with fear and, um, the sweating and the chills and, the, and you're sweating, but you're cold at the same time, which is, you yeah. know, an anomaly in itself. Um, but it's every day it was, it'd be every day. Um, and I used so to you're make, watching this happen to you. Mm-hmm. You're, you're mentally, physically kind of, yeah. and, and and then the divorce and and your mm-hmm. career and you're blowing the whistle at the school about chemicals yeah. and mm-hmm. and then they're trying to get rid of you and, and making life very toxic for you at very. the school you're teaching mm-hmm. at and then they try to get rid of you and then that's when you decide to take the pills. Yeah. How many were you supposed to take? You took eleven. How many were you supposed to take? Um. Like daily morning? you're supposed to take uh two a day one in the morning one at night okay, I believe. you definitely took more than you should have I took about 15 about 15 15 pills yeah yeah, yeah. so mm-hmm. you knew that was not probably beneficial that's dangerous you yeah. know i'm um uh, you know so you're, i don't you're thinking were you calling for help kind of or were you trying to kill yourself what do you what would you say 
part of it was I was fed up. Um, yeah. Part of it was a little bit automatic because there was another time where I took a resistance band and this is, this happened. I call it, I was in Mr. Spock mode, just, you know, from Star Trek, just unemotional. I just, I was walking from one room to the other, from the kitchen to the bathroom. And I work out with resistance bands and things like that. And I just took a resistance band, not even just, I wasn't even thinking I want to die. I want this. I just took it like a robot and wrapped it around my neck and started pulling on it. We and did not talk about this in our no, notes. No, no. no. Okay. So um, I sort of came to and I go, what am I, you know, what am I doing? Yeah. And, um, so you actually passed out. No, no. I, I, I kept pulling on it until I felt uh, I scared myself into. Okay. I got scared. And uh, I said, oh, my and God. Like, what the heck am I doing? What am I doing? I'm trying to kill myself. And yeah. um, that after that incident was one of the stays was one of the, the two week stays I had before the 11 month stay. And then um, the first time I ever tried was I was 26. It was a reaction to uh, Prozac. And mm -hmm. um, one other time uh, I was the times when I, when I was hospitalized a lot, another time was just, I was having so much suicidal ideation um, that, I was afraid I was going to do something to myself with a knife. And I, I went to my psychiatrist, you know, I said, can I come in? And she's like, well, I don't have time. And I said, well, I'm bad. I'm bad. And so I went and um, yeah, that was one of the, that was one of the second or third stay. So yes. um, the, the thing with the, I look at the medications, I say I could blame the medications. Other people do as well. Um, I've never tried to hurt myself when I wasn't on those medications. So okay. there's, there's something, there's something to be said. Um, I don't think they're in my personal opinion, they're researched have been researched for long enough. Enough because yeah. they haven't been around for long enough. Um, right. And they're given out like candy now. And oh, uh, yeah. it's worrisome because maybe people are taking it when they maybe really just going through a, a short, rough time. Yeah. And they could probably ride it out. Um, and then there's, you know, there's people, like you said, like your friends um, who, who unfortunately committed suicide. I don't know what you must be going through. I've, I, I haven't, luckily, I haven't had someone close to me kill themselves. Um, That's crazy. Yeah. And, and their children. And I, 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 can, I can't even imagine what their children feel like. They must feel some sort of bl blame, shame or guilt on themselves, you know, they, my fault or you know things like that some kids feel that um yeah so uh the medications you know you have to be careful and i think they should be a temporary thing um there's new things coming out like psychedelics and you know, i've been offered them and i haven't tried them because i don't know how i'll react you know yeah, um, that's a whole new yeah industry yeah and i don't want to be a, a guinea pig yet again you know um yeah. when you're in the hospital they just they give you well we'll try this we'll try this and they start combining things and then there are side effects uh um for medications like leg tremors drooling um i lost control of my legs in the middle of right uh no it's walgreens now in the middle of walgreens um I, I couldn't walk. I was having leg tremors so bad. I actually bought a cane when I was there to walk home um, mm -hmm. because, and I could have taken an Uber, but I was so stubborn. I was like, no, I'm not letting this. I'm walking home. It's nice out. I walked here. I'm walking back, you know? So there's, there's a, there's, there's a fight there. There's a fire in my belly. Um, I think it takes me a little longer to get there than someone that doesn't have, you know, um, severe anxiety or depression. Right. So tell us what it, so you get to your, now you've, you, everybody's determined you're going to stay at mm -hmm. the last psychiatric ward for now yeah, 11 yeah. months. Correct. Yeah. So and, it was, oh, I'm sorry. Oh, what, so the 11 what then makes you start deciding you're going to write a, write down the stories. Um, a therapist, I had a therapist appointment on a Friday and mm -hmm. she felt that um, um, I wasn't exercising. I was walking the ward, you know, it's, it's, you know, it's a hall, it's a rectangular hallway with the nurses stations in the middle and things like that. So I would walk the hallway and, but I, the exercise bug hadn't kicked in with me. 
And um, I've always been someone that hit the gym. Yeah. Out, and that wasn't happening. And I just wasn't into doing anything. Um, and she said, here's a journal. You write songs, right? I said, yeah, mostly comedy stuff. You know, and she said, just, she goes, today, Saturday, and Sunday, I want you to write three paragraphs. One for today, one for Saturday, one for Sunday. And then I would see her Monday. So Monday rolls around. Um, she goes, did you write anything? And I, I jokingly tossed the book on the table when I walked into the room. And I said, yeah, a little bit. And she goes, how much? I said, 66 pages. And <laughs> she, she went, whoa, keep going. And yeah. um, I kept going. That was a pivotal moment. She actually, sure. that was probably somebody that needed to be put into your path right then. Um, yeah, she was very effective. Um, she unfortunately bogged down with their, the therapists are bogged down with patients. There, there's, you know, you're lucky. It, it's, it's not done by the therapist intentionally. Obviously they want to help you, but they have so many patients to see and they're understaffed, I feel. And you can go, you know, sometimes you go a week, two weeks without seeing somebody. And wow. um, I mean, you know, you're, you're still, in the place where you're supposed yeah. to be getting help. Mm -hmm. And, and, yeah. you know, you'll still have your groups, you know, like music group and art group and exercise group. And those are, you know, men, uh, the instructors of those groups, while, while they are nice people, they don't have really high expectations of, of the patients. So things are kept at a really low, easy level. And, um, you know, they're treated as, you know, that's their limit. And I'm like, well, there could be, they could do a little more, you know, let's get moving, especially the exercise classes. We're just doing light stretching and arm circles and, the attitude was very quiet and calm and no energy. And I'm like, this is, this is making me more depressed, you know? So <laughs> with, with that therapist, she said, just keep writing. And um, so I kept writing. And after I complained about myself enough, I realized, I said, well, this is a pretty interesting place. You know, um, you know, you're making friends write about them. So I started writing about them and their illnesses and what their behaviors are like. And, Everything that I could think about to write about, uh, I wrote about. It, it kept me busy. Um, I also started drawing too. Uh, I do. I can do abstract art a little bit. And and uh, the uncle that well, he passed away. But the uncle that had the wife that passed away, he was an art professor at Columbia University. So there was art in the there's art in the family. So I would draw and, and write. And I filled up three journal. I th filled up three notebooks. Um, they were a hundred pages each. So I wrote 300 yeah. pages and, um, and then I took it when I got discharged, I took it home and I sat with it for a while and I said, I'm going to turn it into a book. I just wasn't ready. And I spoke to an old fraternity brother. I spoke to a friend from elementary school and they both said, your stay at the hospital is the compelling part, you know, and your insights of, what you have of the compelling part because you've had it your whole life and now people are just getting it for the first times in their life and they're your age, they're 50, 52, and they've never experienced anxiety or depression. And maybe unfortunately like your friends that may have caused their suicide, they, it's so new to them that they've never experienced it before and they make a hasty decision. Um, and hopefully whoever is listening or watching is if you feel suicidal, that's the signal. Use it as instead of I'm going to kill myself, say, no, I feel like that. That's when you go get help, you know, and it's a hard decision to make because you're, you know, you're giving up your freedom. I, I, I knew that when I took the pills that either I was going to die or be in the hospital and that when I got to the hospital, it was going to be a long time. Um, and I was giving it, I gave into both. I said, well, whichever one happens, happens. Either I die or I just stay in the hospital. Mm. So luckily the latter happened. I stayed in the hospital. And the, the big thing you learn is that um, you, you learn to accept what you have and um, what your capabilities are and what your positive aspects of, of yourself are and what your negative aspects of yourself are. And if you can admit those things, um, it's very freeing um, to admit, especially your shortcomings or things that you've done wrong in life or things that you regret that you never said out loud. Um, 
Mm. Because it's like writing. It's like crying. It's like you have to get out. Crying, I think, is very healthy. Um, you know, you just don't want to do it in front of everybody because it's, you know, it's it's a little embarrassing. Um, you don't want to people don't want to look weak or things like that. But it's if if you have someone that you could cry to, then you do it. If you cry on your own, do it. Being and going vulnerable, down, being right? Vulnerable. And the thing about the That's medication. The thing about the, those medications is that you don't cry. You don't feel anything. You sort of feel uh, ambivalent. Yeah. There's an ambivalence toward things. And, oh, my um, God. That reminds me. I This is so funny that you're saying this, and we didn't talk about this beforehand, but I, I was just searching through podcasts, and I found uh, Oprah's Super Soul because okay. eventually I would like to – interview Oprah because she sure. sort of got me started on all this but there is a uh, Frank Bruni Bruni hold on <laughs> Bruni the beauty of dusk and the book is mm -hmm. and I just heard about it last night and it was all about vulnerability and mm -hmm. how important that is for us to live our lives and you're yep. saying the same thing yeah that's it's, so it's interesting the uh, the therapist I went to for the longest time, I went to him for 16 years. And the reason why I think he was a great therapist was because he didn't start, um, he didn't become a psychiatrist until he was 40. And he his family was in the garment district, very wealthy. And he, he never revealed what his mental illness was, but I know he went through a lot. And I think the best therapists are the ones that have a mental illness. And... Um, and have dealt with it and have dealt with it because they live right. it. They, they know and how they, to get through it and they've studied it. And, um, I learned early on even to, even to admit embarrassing dreams that you've had in the past. Um, or, uh, you know, uh, the reason why you do a, a couple of shots of, you know, Jack Daniels before going on stage and, and, you know, you, you're partying with people and you want to have a few drinks and, and, it, you know, a couple of shots feels good. It loosens up your throat. And he's, and he was saying, ah, bullshit. You have stage fright. And I'm like, well, it's not really stage fright. It's more of, I'm more worried about my voice, not sounding good when I, you know, I, I want to sound good, you know, and that would be the only worry I had about singing it wasn't going up there and, you know, looking like a fool. It was like, I need to sound good. And, and the whiskey gives you a little buzz and a little more confidence to, you know, hit the notes that you wouldn't normally try to hit if you're feeling unsure about how your voice is that night, you know? So he would call me on, on my, on my bull crap and things like that. At, and it was very shocking because he's, you know, Brooklyn accent and, you know, he sounded like, uh, he looked like an, uh, he looks like what Robert De Niro looks like now, you know, <laughs> gray hair. He, he actually looked like what Robert De Niro looked like when he played Bernie Madoff. That's exactly what he looked like. So when wow. I was watching the movie on HBO, I'm like, oh, my God, I'm like, this can't be. He looks too much like the therapist. I don't want him to be a bad guy, you know. Yeah. So uh, when you admit things that you're embarrassed about or um, have been holding in and just never admitted, there's a, a, a big release that happens. And then therapy becomes very freeing. You, you look forward to going because, wow, I just said that I can say anything, you know, it's mm. like and and it's really accepting that everybody has feelings and you can have the most horrifying feelings in the world. You could be, have homicidal feelings. You could have, you know, you could dream of, of hurting people. You could have dreams of, um, you know, being a rock star. You could have a dream of, of whatever, whatever it is you have. It depends on what your behavior is. You know, like you want to, somebody cuts you off on the highway, you want to shoot them, but you don't you know, but you think about it and it's okay to think about it, you know, because that's a normal thought. It crosses your mind and, and people think that way. And as long as you don't act on it, then you're, then you're doing fine. But you're but saying to hold share that feeling and not to let it in and say, I have this anger over the stupidest of mm -hmm. things. How do I combat that? Um, not suppress by, it, right? Yeah. You, you, you express it, but you don't, you know, act out, you talk about it. You try to, if, if you're someone that's physical, you know, hit a, hit a punching bag, play a drum, go for a walk, uh, do push ups, um, you draw, you find, uh, you find you your, need, your things. 
Yeah. Cause yeah. for a lot, for me, I can't think my way out of anxiety. You know, you, you, if you lay in bed all day, um, you can't think your way out of that. You have to do something physical to, to change your mindset. Um, okay. there are, you know, well, it doesn't, let me ask you a quick question, Peter. Sure. So what happens if somebody, I mean, I know people who have depression and have mm -hmm. anxiety and say, I'm like, well, just go for a walk. It'll make you feel mm -hmm. better. They're like, you don't understand. I can't just get up and go for a walk. What mm -hmm. is that thing that you think would turn that I'm here in this place? I don't know how to get to that. How, what's in that in between? What is that? There's that's where your nerve has to come in and you know, you have to force yourself. You do. And, and sometimes the, you know, it's, it's, it sounds like an, a cliche, but the first step is the hardest step. And it is, that's the hardest step. The, the hardest thing to do is to start writing down. It, I didn't have a tough time writing the journal, you know, just all sort of came out. But mm -hmm. when there were times where, how honest do I want to be, you know, um, with myself with this? And it would be a hundred percent, right? Yeah. Yeah, it was a hundred point. Yeah, I just let every everything out. Yeah. Uh, you know, there's there's places to do that. You know, you, you shouldn't be telling your feelings to everybody. Um, you know, if you want to have a certain amount of privacy in your life. Um, so I guess but, the question is: the answer is to find those places and find, find those. those yeah, put, put, find, put the find stupid nerve. sneaker on your foot. Mm -hmm. Put the sneaker on your foot. Yeah. Yeah. Start. It's. It starts by, you know, there's people, there's Facebook groups with people with anxiety and depression. And I talked to them. A few people reached out after the book came out and I was very surprised. And, you know, they, they, there's people that can't get out of bed to go brush their teeth. Um, mm -hmm. They haven't, they haven't showered in weeks. And what do you um, say to these people? I say, you, you, ha you have to force yourself. To, if, if they can't do anything that there's, it's almost like you're paralyzed in bed. And there's nothing relaxing about it. Um, and for people that don't have it and don't understand it and view people that are depressed in bed, you know, it happens. As lazy, and, right? And that it's not. Yeah, they think of it as lazy. And it's torment. You're not, yeah, you don't want to be there. Because, um, yeah, it is. It's torture laying under there. Um, yeah. And you can get used to it. Um, and that's where you get stuck. You get used to that thought pattern. And it's, it's, as, it's as simple as moving your body. And that's basically what, you know, what I've perceived the, the basis of cognitive behavioral therapy as you have to do something physical to simply distract your mind. It's a mind trick. You know, if you go outside and take a walk, you're going to see a dog, you're going to see a bird, you're going to see a car that you like, you're going to see a person. Um, distract your mind. Outside stimulus. That is, oh, that's not, it. yeah, it's outside <laughs> stimulus. So give us an example. That's huge, by the way. Mm -hmm. Give us, um, do you have like a story of someone in your book um, that you can share that that just was so powerful to you? Um, the guy from Israel. Uh, he saw me, there were two people, uh, the guy from Israel and this, um, the bipolar woman uh, that I met she's a very interesting person. She was, if I was Charlie Brown, she was Peppermint Patty. So, you know, Peppermint oh. Patty, is, Peppermint Patty is Charlie Brown's biggest emotional support. She believes in him more than Linus does because Linus always reminds Charlie Brown of his limitations. Peppermint Patty oh. does it. She tells him he could do anything. Come on, Chuck. So, yeah. Come on, Chuck. Do it. You know, calling him by his incorrect name because she sees him as Chuck as someone that can do it, you know, and wow, um, so this woman, this bipolar woman, she was like that. Um, she wore her heart on her sleeve. She was she would say everything that was on her mind. Unfortunately, you know, one hour she'd be acting completely normal. And uh, the next hour she's curled up on, in a ball on the floor crying. And wow. she, her story was extreme. She lived in New Orleans. She drove up to Connecticut to go to her mother's funeral, which she was banned from going. And then after the funeral, um, she snuck into the cemetery. They buried the urn in a little plot and she dug up the urn and stole it and came to the hospital and um, she stole it, came to New York, met a boyfriend that was homeless and he brought it to the hospital. She was having um, 
meltdowns. So um, wow. it's, it's, I say in the book, I said, sometimes you could find, you know, solace from a person who's bipolar riding around New York City with her mother's stolen ashes. <laughs> and um, she was a big influence. She she I, I told her about my life and everything that I that I've been through and the things that I do. And, you know, I could sing and drum and I'm funny and all these things. And we did karaoke and she heard me sing and she was she goes, you, she she would say, you're the coolest mother effer I've ever met. You know, <laughs> she goes, there's so much more to you than this illness there's, there's this isn't all of you and right. she said it a doctor said it um the guy from israel said it and for some reason when it comes from a patient when they say this is not the real you it 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 feels a little more genuine because they're living it they're you know? in it they're in it and when someone says to you that's really sick um mentally ill or they're sick and they say to you, this is not who you are. I see what you really are. And I see what your capabilities are. And um, that's the other thing I learned. They, they have people that are schizophrenic or very mentally have mentally ill have moments of this clarity. And you see who they once were or who they could be if they didn't have the illness. And mm -hmm. they have a lot of wisdom to share. And... Um, I got to speak to a lot of schizophrenics um, to talk about what the voices sound like, what it feels like. Do they know it's there? Are they seeing things? What do you see? Um, and it's it, it became very interesting. Um, I was always interested in psychology. Um, when I was teaching, I had gone back to school for two years to become a school counselor. So I have 36 uh, master's credits in child psychology or uh, school counseling. So um, once I started talking to people, let me take a sip of tea. Take a sip of tea. <laughs> I took my disgusting tea. Um, once I started having conversations with people and learning about what's going on with them, um, there was just more material to write and it was helping me. And uh, yeah. those people, there were people uh, that I became friends with and this one guy, um, in particular, Bronx Psychiatric. He's the one that got me exercising again, this other patient. Um, he's going to be there for life, unfortunately. He's extremely um, schizophrenic, um, violent. If he's not on meds, he gets day passes sometimes to leave the hospital, but he's got to come back. Or he has, um, uh, they, he gets to go on day trips with chaperones, things like that. And he needed to, he wanted to lose weight. So he started walking the ward at Bronx Psychiatric. And he goes, why don't you walk with me today? And I wasn't, I didn't want to, you know, he goes, come on, walk with me. And he was in his thirties. And so I started walking with him and then click, it clicked. The fitness oh, that's bug, so good. bug clicked. And I wasn't losing any weight because I was on lithium and Seroquel. And those two medications made me gain 70 pounds. Oh, and but obviously you've lost it since. I, I lost I when I was discharged, I weighed 226. Oh my and God. then and my, my most recent um physical, I was 170. So the doctor is very happy. And that's the other thing with all these medications, your cholesterol skyrockets, your liver numbers go up because that's how the medication is processed. So I'm not someone that's oh yeah, on your liver. I'm I'm not a consistent drinker. It'll be socially and two or three if, if I do have, um, because, you know, I get nauseous, I get heartburn, you know, I don't, you know, I become a, I'm a lightweight in terms of that. And it's not something that I ever think about. There's no alcohol in my house. I never think about, Oh, I need a drink. You know, it's just something that never crosses my mind. Luckily, because yeah, it's a lucky when, you you're, think. when you're a musician, there's free alcohol everywhere. So, right. um, back. So, so this guy got me walking again. And then next thing you know, I'm doing push-ups. And then I'm using chairs to do bicep curls and um, crunches. And I wasn't I wasn't losing any weight. And when I got discharged, the doctor looked at my blood, my blood results, my blood test results. He said, You have the liver of someone that drinks consistently and you don't drink. He's and you, time you to switch to medicine, right? You need to make a choice. So yeah. against my psychiatrist's wishes. I, and without her knowing, which was probably not the smartest thing to do, but because of the therapists, I was taught how to wean off of medications. 
Um, I had been on uh, lithium and Seroquel for almost a year. Mm. So they say, you know, take about, you know, three or four months to do it. So I decided to do it in about seven months. I doubled the time. And I just followed the directions, you know, and I yeah. remembered what I remembered what my old therapist told me. And I told my general physician I was doing it. I kept him abreast of it. Um, I told my psychologist I was doing it, which is strange because they work. The psychologist and the psychiatrist are in the same office. They're part of the same practice. And it was funny. He said to me, he goes, remember, he goes, she the psychiatrist. He goes, she works for you. If you don't want to take these meds anymore, don't take them. And I was shocked that he said that, you know, yeah. but um, I wasn't happy with the way I looked and I was training as hard as I could. I was dieting as, as much as I do. Um, I eat healthy. And well, you were saying also the met, you know, there is a huge connection between feeling good, mm -hmm. looking good. Mm -hmm. Correct. And here. Yeah. It's all you really needed to get that dialed in. Mm hmm. Yeah. And I think so many people forget that even if you you're like, oh, I'm fine with my body and you may be mm -hmm. 20, 30 pounds overweight. Mm -hmm. It does affect you. It, yeah, there's certain. Yeah, it makes you lethargic. Um, uh, Our bodies being, aren't meant to carry a lot of excess. Weight. No, being being overweight is, you know, there's you know, you don't want to get accused of, of these days it's called fat shaming. But unfortunately, right. be, being overweight and being obese is is dangerous. You know, it's, you're it's just unhealthy. Yeah. You and, and like it or not. you know, I've known I've known about it for years being a phys ed teacher. And yeah. when I started teaching, they, they still do it. The kids get phys ed once a week. And yeah. in New York State, there's elementary school children are supposed to get it every day. And middle school and high school kids are supposed to get it every other day. And my sons are in high school. They have gym once a week. My son's yeah. in sixth grade. He has it once a week. And it's ridiculous. Um, yeah. And, and for some kids, that's all the physical activity they get today. You know, um, and when I was in grad school, I started in 1995 and they said, you're going to watch the obesity rate skyrocket. And the other the other thing they oh, said no. was <laughs> they, they said it's going to skyrocket. And they were correct. And the other thing they said was, whatever you do, don't work for New York City schools. And I didn't listen to that because I wound up doing so it. Let me ask you a question as we wrap it up, Peter. Mm -hmm. What do you want to accomplish with this book? Moving um, forward. Moving forward, I, I don't want to be like a Tony Robbins, this, a motivational speaker, somebody like that with something that, hey, buy my book in this 12-step program. It, it's more of, it's it's a realistic view of everything. And it goes back to um, either you're born with it or it can manifest over, over your lifetime. Um, if it's something that's new that's happening to you, then you go get help immediately. And mm -hmm. it, if you feel like if you have suicidal thoughts, you instead of acting on hurting yourself, you use it as that's the signal. That's the bat signal. You know, right. go for Set help. There's nothing to be embarrassed about, you know, and and it's it's funny. The, the thing I say to people, I go, you know, you know, hospitals weren't invented just because of you. You know, the psych world wasn't invented because right. you exist. You're you not know? the only one. You're not the only one. And. It's a cliche, but hey, you're not the only one. There's a lot in, and that's what this uh, author said. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Was there's a lot to be said about cliches. Mm -hmm. If you can get over the fact that they're overused, yeah. what they yeah. symbolize and what they say is mm -hmm. actually very good advice. Yeah. And there's if you had one thing, Peter, one mm -hmm. thing that um, uh, your takeaway for anybody reading your book or listening to this podcast, what would it be? Um, to be realistic about um, what you have, to accept what you have, and that it's if you were born with it, it's it it sounds it's not pessimistic, but it's probably not going to go away. Um, you were born with it. You were predisposed. It's there, and um, there's a way to live life where you can keep it at a low level. Um, that doesn't mean it's you're not going to have bad times again. You know, you're probably gonna, you know, and that's the reality of it. And to fight it makes it worse. You know, if someone was going through a rough time and I use the cliche, I use the, uh, uh, a metaphor of, all right, you're, you're surfing on a rough wave. Just surf the wave and ride just it out. Ride don't, it out. Don't, ride think about it out. Why, 
why is this happening? I don't want this to happen. And that's the worst thing you could do. I don't want this. I don't want this. Just you close your eyes, you breathe, you take your walk and you just, you use your body as it's much like as you the can. current. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Like you're saying, like you're in a current, you're not go supposed to fight it. You're supposed to mm -hmm. go with the current. Go with I the love current. That. Yeah. It's, yes. it's, and, and I use, um, another metaphor. It's like, you know, you're on a river, there's going to be rapids and you can't fight them in order to get down the river, you know, and hopefully between the rapids, there are long periods of calmness and, yes. um, you not saying you can't think your way out of it because there's people that do meditation and uh, that may not work for everybody. It doesn't right. work. For me. It doesn't work for me. Unfortunately, I, I've tried it many times for years and years. I find that playing an instrument, playing my drums, hitting a heavy bag. Yeah. Right. You find, find, find what works for you just because something is popular. Doesn't mean you have to do it. You know, um, people love yoga. Okay. Um, you know, I like parts of yoga. I'm not the most flexible person in the world, but I take what I like from yoga and I use it. You know, um, I do do deep breathing exercises sometimes to calm down. Um, so I, I do take parts of meditation or music that I listen to at night is meant for meditation. Um, yeah, maybe that's the point, Peter. There's so mm -hmm. much out there that we can just yeah. extrapolate what works. Try, for you know, just try. try yeah, you know, yeah. I wrote on the back of the book, you know, you have to be open minded enough just to try something different. It doesn't, and it does, the changes that, that you make don't have to be very extreme because if you go to the extreme, you burn out very quickly. And I had some burnout this, the past year, because as I was writing the book, I was trying to lose the weight. And then and I wound up taking a course to be a, become a home inspector. So I studied and passed that course and I passed the national exam surprisingly. And, um, and then the book came out. So I've been on, you know, I've been promoting the book nonstop and yeah, a lot of work. There was, I hit burnout in January. I was like in bed for a few days and I'm going, what's going, why am I depressed? Why am I anxious? And I'm going, and oh how'd you, how'd you get out of it? I stopped going online so much. Um, ah, and, and, and getting the proper amount of sleep. And even though I'm, it's, it's fun promoting the book and it, it is fun. Like I was up at four in the morning, talking to this college kid from Pakistan and he couldn't figure out a way to get himself help. And I said, well, mm -hmm. is there a psychiatry psychology department at your college? He said, yeah. I said, go to the psychology department. They'll get you on. They'll get you somebody. So well, Peter, I don't know if you realize this, but perhaps you wrote the book so that you could be there for others. Yeah. It's um, like I mentioned the home in inspection. It's, it's something that I look at as it's a good job. It pays well. And, you know, I'm thinking we already about, talked about this. Yeah. You're not supposed to do that. Yeah. My heart is my heart's <laughs> going in this direction. You Your know? heart's going where people and you're more and more people place. are going to find you and more mm -hmm. and more people are going to seek you out. Yeah. And you're probably going to have to write another book. Yeah. And how can people find you and find the book? Uh, they can find me on Facebook under Peter Vox and the links to the book are all there. I post daily. Um, or oh, there's a charity event I'm doing that I'd like to promote the, the take back the night walk in New York city. It's on June 4th. Um, and it starts, uh, I forget what time you can look it up. It's called take back the night. It's a walk for suicide prevention, um, for people that have survived suicide attempts and for people that know people that have unfortunately wow. committed suicide. So I volunteered, I'm going to be a coach. So I'm going to give out drinks and snacks and it's a 15 mile walk. Uh, we'll start at the intrepid. And um, uh, you raise money on your own for it, or you can donate and walk. So um, I just donated money, so just to walk, and and it's fun. You stay up all night, and that's something I like to do. So um, you know, you hang out at the museum for a while, you stay up all night, you walk with people in the middle of the summer night, you know, well, spring night, make and um, you make some connections, you make some friends. Um, I'll talk about the book, you know, um, uh, to anyone that's interested in it. And, um, and it's just to do, you know, you, you, it's important to do something different, you know, just try something different. And it doesn't have to be, like I said, so extreme, you right. know, and giving um, back and giving back. And it brings, it brings joy. Yeah. Um, find joy in anything else. Yeah. You, it's, right? it's important. You know, it, it, yeah. it makes you feel better for yourself when you, when you help somebody, it's rewarding in, in both ways. Um, a lot like singing is you feel great when 
um, when you sing, it's 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 a release of emotions, and then there's people dancing. Or I was performing at a 50th wedding anniversary. I was in an Italian wedding band. I had to learn a Josh Groban song, and his songs are it's directly in my range, so I can sing him very well, to be honest. And um, I sang the song, and I got a standing ovation, and the couple was crying. And oh, I that's like, great! Wow. And I was like, this and. You know, you do it for for a lot of years because you want to be famous and, you know, and, and it brings you peace of mind for the most part. And But when you make a couple cry and you get a standing ovation because you brought everybody such happiness, um, you want to do it again. And you get the same feeling of being on stage when when someone says, oh, my God, thank you for showing me that that way that. Or, or or thinking that way. And Peter, that's amazing. Yeah. It's Peter. you know, and yeah, so good. Thank it's you for having so me. So good. So everyone, get this book. Should I put titled, I show it? I have it right here. Oh, sure. The Psych there Ward is. Notes: Surviving Anxiety and Depression by Peter Fox. Peter, it's on Amazon. It's on Amazon if you want to, and Kindle, and you know, oh, you perfect. can find it on on Facebook. Excellent. So thank you so much time for your time today, Peter. Thank you so much. I hope I oh, wasn't yes. too verbose. No, it's all good. And until next time, breathe in your second win. Thank you for listening today. I hope that something you heard made you smile, made you think, and made you feel. If these incredible stories empowered you, awakened you, or left you feeling inspired, make sure to share with a friend and write us a review on iTunes so we can continue to change lives through this content. Make sure you tag us while you're listening on our Facebook group, My Second Wind, or hit the link in the show notes to join the conversation. Until next time, go ahead and breathe in your second wind.